a very warm welcome. You are watching Gravitas with me, Molly Gampir. We are starting off the show tonight with some uh, breaking developments coming in. Uh, the entire 22-member crew of the cargo ship that struck a major bridge in Baltimore today, causing it to snap and plunge into the river below, are Indians, as per the latest that has come in. The Singapore flagship collided with one of the pillars of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore is what we know at this point. And according to the vessel information provided by the Synergy Marine Group, the crew was all Indian, 22 in total. For more on this, uh, my colleague Susan Tehrani is uh, with us on the broadcast to get us more inputs and details as far as the latest that's trickling in. Susan, uh, if I can begin by asking you to tell us uh, more about uh, what we know so far and uh, what the authorities are saying. Yeah, so basically the ship lost control uh, leaving the port and the crew on board informed authorities that they had lost control of the ship uh, and then you know we saw those really devastating images of ultimately the ship hitting the bridge uh, there was a press conference with maryland's uh, governor and authorities as well Cir search and rescue operations continue about six people are apparently still in the water that they're searching for um, they couldn't exactly say how many cars uh, might have been also uh, underwater, uh, but we're looking for information regarding that as well. As you mentioned, uh, all 22 members, uh, we are told, are Indian uh, on that ship. And, you know, while the immediate impact, of course, is devastation and sorrow, uh, there's going to be long haul investigations as to how this happened. But something very important is that this bridge uh, is going to be closed for a very long period of time. And this collapse really caused uh, problems and it will cause problems for uh, the supply chain issue. It's one of the really busiest routes for coal, cargo um, and, and cars as well, really passing, uh, bringing it into the United States. All right. Uh, thanks very much for that uh, update, Susan. Of course, we are coming back to you as and when we have further updates trickle in. Let's also get you these reactions that have come in so far. As units were responding, they began to receive numerous calls indicating multiple people in the water. At some point during that, that chain of events of calls, uh, we began to receive indications that a, uh, a ship may have struck the key bridge. We got further information through multiple calls that the key bridge, um, portions of the key bridge had actually collapsed. At about 0150 hours, our first unit arrived on scene and reported um, a complete collapse of the key bridge. Um, we were also given information at that time that there were likely multiple people on the bridge at the time of the collapse and that as a result, multiple people were in the water. My entire cart, it's like a about a three foot cart and it's made of metal. The whole thing shook. So I thought I had hit something. I thought I hit maybe a pallet jack piece or some debris on the ground. And then I asked a few other co-workers, like, did y'all just feel that? And everybody was like, yeah, man, that was hard. That was like hard rumbling thunder. We don't know what it was. So two o'clock rolls around. We go out on break. Mind you, it's very dark outside but we have a perfect view of the bridge in the videos and photos I sent you or the video and photos I sent you. You can see, like, you can see the bridge even though it's dark out. My coworker goes, Jay, look, the bridge collapsed. And I was like, you're lying, stop playing with me. He goes, no, go look. 
That was basically an eyewitness narrating uh, what was seen and also a reaction coming in from the mayor of Baltimore, as Susan was pointing out. Um, as of now, that's the information that we have at this point. We will, of course, keep a close eye for any further details that come in. Shifting focus for now. From the Red Sea to the Malacca Strait, India is providing security to the entire Indian Ocean region amid Chinese provocations in the high seas. You see, since 2019, China has been sending spy ships to countries near India. They call them ocean research vessels. But what they really are, are spy ships. They are aimed at keeping a close eye on Indian assets in the region. In fact, in recent days, Beijing has become more brazen, sending not one, not two, but four spy ships to the Indian Ocean. Two of these Chinese spy ships have been in the Bay of Bengal for several days now. But New Delhi is having none of it. Now, India also has deployed its own research vessel. It's called RV Samudra Ratnakar. And India's research vessel has been positioned right between the two Chinese survey ships. RV Samudra Ratnakar now stands between China's Xiang Yang Hong 01 and Xiang Yang Hong 03, located off India's eastern coast. The RV Samudra Ratnakar is a state of the art oceanographic research vessel. Who is operating it? the Geological Survey of India. It has been built by Hyundai Heavy Industries in South Korea. It is a 103 meter long ship equipped for extended missions and capable of continuous sailing for 45 days. It can accommodate up to 73 personnel, including 25 geoscientists. Now this deployment comes as Chinese military ship, the Yuan Wong 3 has been sailing in the same region the RV Samudra Ratnakar boasts an impressive array of scientific equipment, including positioning systems, sonar systems, seismic equipment, magnetometers, gravimeters. It also comes with remotely operated vehicle, coring and sampling devices, marine data management system. You see, China's Yuan Wang class ships are believed to be used for tracking and supporting ballistic missiles. Naturally, their presence near India's strategic locations causes great concern for New Delhi. It is clear that if China was genuinely conducting research in the area, there would be no need to send such ships near Indian assets. Moreover, China's activities in the Indian Ocean have sparked serious concerns which cannot be ignored. You see, China is a habitual offender, trying to undermine the sovereignty and autonomy of countries. It does this by building military bases in the region. Think the military base in Djibouti, Gwadar, Hambantota. They may be located in different countries, but they are a part of the same design. There's more. In Myanmar, China is intensifying its efforts to complete the Kuakpu port. In Bangladesh, it is increasing its involvement under the Belt and Road Initiative. In the Maldives, it is expanding an artificial island and investing heavily. In Seychelles, China is investing in strategic projects. China's ultimate goal is full control of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. As far as the Indian Ocean region is concerned, China, despite China's expansionist dreams, China, India has been successfully crushing its efforts. Over the weekend, the Kalvari class Scorpion submarine reached INS Bars for an inaugural visit. It is India's last base in the eastern Indian Ocean region. Now, this is a significant milestone for the Indian forces, and here's why. INS Bars is a naval air station situated near Campbell Bay in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. It is the southernmost naval air station of the Indian Armed Forces. The Indian port overlooks the Strait of Malacca, which is a narrow sea lane that connects the Indian Ocean with the South China Sea. This lane, as you know, is strategically and economically important for Beijing. Additionally, the island of Campbell Bay is located just 145 kilometers north of Indonesia. It can control the six-degree shipping channel between Great Nicobar and the Indonesian island of Sumatra. 
The first ever visit by an Indian submarine of this class to this strategic port amplifies the Indian Navy's reach far away from the mainland, allowing reach and operational flexibility in rapidly sending stealth submarines in areas of interest and beyond. Not only that, India has also been expanding the runway at INS bars to help operate maritime surveillance planes. In the year 2022, the Indian Air Force's C-130J Special Operations Aircraft landed at INS Bars. All this shows how the Indian Navy is expanding its capabilities and strengthening its position in the region, especially at a time when the Chinese have been sending their submarines to the region. India is significantly boosting its naval presence in these waters by showcasing its powerful submarine fleet. The Indian Navy also recently demonstrated its operational readiness by conducting an exercise in the Arabian Sea. It included a powerful display of eight submarines operating together. This unprecedented demonstration has shown the world the Indian Navy's exceptional underwater muscle. In fact, over the weekend, the Navy chief hailed the completion of 100 days of naval operations against anti-drone, anti-missile and anti-piracy attacks in the Gulf of Aden, Arabian Sea and the Red Sea. He affirmed that the Indian Navy will continue to, number one, take affirmative action, number two, prevent such incidents and number three, maintain India's dominant position in the region. Already, the Indian Navy has displayed this by responding to allies' calls for help in the Indian Ocean region and fulfilling India's responsibility towards maritime security and stability after an increase in the number of Houthi attacks in the Red Sea and a resurgence in piracy attempts. India has deployed at least a dozen warships to provide security to the merchant vessels. The Indian Navy chief also revealed that the Indian Navy had simultaneously deployed 11 conventional submarines for operations in different parts of the Indian Ocean region. This has been the highest number of operational submarines for the Indian Navy in the last two decades. So basically, with Beijing making no bones about its intentions to try and dominate the Indian Ocean region, India is leaving no stone unturned to challenge China's rapid expansion in the region. Sure, India's submarine fleet may not match up to China's, but that has not stopped India from becoming the region's leading security provider, something that China has not been able to do. China's interests in Pakistan are at risk. We have been telling you about this. In the latest, five Chinese nationals were killed in an explosion during an attack on their convoy by a suicide bomber. The bomber rammed an explosives-laden vehicle into a convoy of Chinese engineers who were traveling from Islamabad to their camp in Dasu in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Five Chinese engineers, along with their Pakistani driver, were killed in the bombing. Dasu is the site of a major dam, and the area has been attacked in the past. In fact, in 2021, a blast on a bus killed 13 people, including nine Chinese nationals. This is the third major attack on Chinese interests in Pakistan in a span of just one week. The first two attacks hit an airbase and a strategic port in the Balochistan area, where China is investing billions, remember, in infrastructure projects. The rise in such attacks have raised security concerns surrounding China's Belt and Road projects in the country. It also presents a whole new challenge for the Shehbaz Sharif government. You see, attacks against Chinese investments in Pakistan are not new. However, the fact that Pakistan has not been able to stop them undermines Islamabad's assurances to Beijing. Chinese engineers have been working on a number of projects in Pakistan, with Beijing investing over $65 billion as part of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. No one has claimed responsibility for Tuesday's attack, but that's not surprising. No group or individual claimed responsibility for the 2021 attack. This is just Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Monday's attack on the naval airbase in Turbat 
was claimed by the Baloch Liberation Army, an outlawed group of separatists in the Balochistan province that see the Chinese investment in their country as exploitative. A week ago, they targeted the strategic Gwadar port complex as well. This port is key to China's interests in the region. In a statement, the BLA said that members of its so-called suicide unit, known as the Majid Brigade, carried out the raid. We told you last week the Majid Brigade of the BLA is the suicide squad of the group. Their goal basically is to carve out an independent state in the province of Balochistan. Now, for the Baloch militants, the attack on Gwadar was a warning to foreign investors interested in Gwadar. A clear reference to China. In the aftermath, China condemned the attack, but the truth is Beijing is worried about its investments in Pakistan. You see, Beijing has repeatedly urged Islamabad to do more to protect its nationals and investments, and cash-strapped Pakistan sorely needs Chinese investments. But these attacks have called into question the effectiveness of Pakistan's efforts to expand security for Chinese interests in the country. Remember, Pakistan is home to twin insurgencies, one by Islamists and the other by ethnic militants seeking secession. Chinese interests are primarily targeted by the ethnic militants, seeking to push China out of the mineral-rich Balochistan. The Baloch militants generally operate in the country's south and southwest, which is far from the site of today's attack. In these parts, specifically in northwestern regions of Pakistan, Islamists operate. These recent attacks have not only raised concerns about the security situation in the country, but they have also occurred a few weeks after Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif took office, following Pakistan's controversial elections in February. Reports suggest that Sharif is expected to visit Beijing, which will be his first visit since becoming the Prime Minister. However, he may face some challenges during his trip. The new government aims to resume work on the CPEC projects and Sharif's visit to Beijing may play a crucial role in achieving this very goal. Will he be successful with the current situation on the ground is the question. We will have to wait and watch. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu stands more isolated than ever. His global allies are slowly turning their back on him. So are those at home. Just have a look at what really is going on. The United Nations Security Council has passed a resolution. It has called for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. All while the US, Israel's biggest supporter in this war, stood aside and watched. Yes, the U.S. abstained from voting. This fell short of Israel's expectations. You see, Netanyahu wanted Biden to veto the resolution, but that clearly did not happen. There were bound to be some repercussions. And it did not take too long. Soon after the resolution was passed, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu called off a delegation visit to the United States. Two of his top advisers were scheduled to visit America. They were supposed to discuss the Rafah offensive, which, remember, Israel has been threatening for a while. But now the talks have been stalled and the fate of Rafah hangs in the balance. Netanyahu has further accused the U.S. of abandoning its policy in the U.N. And the U.S. has reacted by saying that it is perplexed by the Israeli decision. The entire fiasco has exposed the growing rift between the two sides. You see, this is the strongest public clash between Netanyahu and Biden. And it's not going to do well for Israel, which is nearing total isolation on the world stage. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken warned of the same a few days ago, in fact. Listen into this. Uh, as we've said, though, a major military ground operation in Rafa is not the way to do it. Uh, it risks killing more civilians. It risks uh, wreaking greater havoc with the provision of humanitarian assistance. It risks further isolating Israel uh, around the world and jeopardizing its long-term security and standing. But the Israeli Prime Minister does not agree. 
Here's what he has to say. I met today with Secretary of State Blinken. I told him that I greatly appreciate the fact that for more than five months, we are standing together in the war against Hamas. But I also said that we have no way to defeat Hamas without entering Rafah and eliminating the rest of the battalions there. And I told him that I hope we will do it with the support of the United States. But if we have to, we will do it alone. As you can see, the Allies have been openly contradicting each other. And they have been doing so for a while now, by the way. Netanyahu went so far as to say the IDF will enter Rafah even if it does not have America's blessings. Just where is Netanyahu even getting this confidence from? Whose support does Israel have if the U.S. pulls out? All 14 UNSC members, excluded, excluding the U.S., voted in favor of the ceasefire. France, too, also, in fact, has, is, has been hardening its stance on Israel. During a phone call on Sunday, the French President Emmanuel Macron warned Netanyahu against displacing Gazans from Rafah. He said this would be a war crime. He also condemned Israel's plan to seize Palestinian land in the West Bank. And now the Royal Air Force has also begun to intervene. It is airdropping aid into Gaza. This is a first ever since the war broke out. And in another first, it had voted yes in the UNSC vote. While it had abstained from voting in the earlier three ceasefire resolutions. What does this mean? That Netanyahu is being abandoned by everyone, is it? Not only abroad, but at home as well, in fact. Polls have been showing that if an election is held now, Netanyahu would be soundly defeated. Usually his lawmakers do his bidding and defend his actions, but now it seems even his coalition is shaky. Veteran Israeli minister Gideon Saar has announced his departure. This comes after his demands to be appointed to the high-level war cabinet were not met. And this is what he had to say. I can't carry the responsibility if I do not have in my judgment a real possibility to influence the direction of policy. I simply do not see any benefit in this. Therefore, with a heavy heart, I announced a while ago my intention to resign from the government and signed a letter of resignation to the Prime Minister according to Section 22 of law related to the foundation of government. And with that, Netanyahu's coalition has shrunk from 76 to 72 seats in the 120-member parliament. While there is no immediate threat to the government's stability, it still is a warning sign. Benny Gantz has threatened to quit the government as well if the Haredi draft bill, which exempts ultra-Orthodox Jews from conscription, is passed. You see, pressure is mounting on Prime Minister Netanyahu from all sides. What will he do is the question. On to India now, where the poll fever is at its peak, with the first phase of polling set for the 19th of April. A lot is happening by the hour. Parties announcing candidates, leaders even switching sides, parties holding huge campaign events. And amid all of this, a lot of he said, she said. Now, according to the Model Code of Conduct issued by the Election Commission of India, criticism of other political parties shall be confined to, other, to their policies and programs. Adding that criticism of all aspects of private life of the leaders or workers of other parties based on unverified allegations or distortion shall be avoided. Please maintain decorum in campaigning and refrain from abuses and personal attacks. Please don't try to cross the red line. But what if someone crosses the line? This brings us to the biggest war of words of the day. A national spokesperson of the Indian National Congress shared a picture of actor-turned-politician Kangana Ranaut on Instagram. The photo was posted with a denigrating, rather disparaging remark. We choose to not repeat the comments. 
The post was deleted minutes later, but it was already too late. The ruling BJP went ballistic against the Congress over the post. The BJP, which has fielded Kangana Ranaut as a candidate for the upcoming elections, accused the Congress leadership of insulting women. The party also demanded the Congress must sack its spokesperson. The Congress spokesperson, on her part, has distanced herself from the post. She said a lot of people have access to her social media accounts and that the post was shared by someone else without her knowledge. Kangana Ranaut reacted to the political storm earlier today. In a post on social media platform X, Ranaut said, I'm quoting, We must refrain from using sex workers' challenging lives or circumstances as some kind of abuse or slur. She added that every woman deserves her dignity. Meanwhile, India's National Commission for Women has reacted sharply on the matter. The statutory body wrote to the Election Commission of India to take strict action against the Congress and the spokesperson. The Election Commission has already warned parties and their leaders and workers against any such indecent acts and remarks. Now, for the Election Commission, there are two issues to tackle here. Indecent and personal attacks is a clear-cut case of violation of the model code of conduct. The second is regarding the spread of misinformation through social media. The Congress spokesperson claimed the post shared by her Instagram account was first shared by a parody account of her name on Twitter and claims it is from here that one of the persons with access to her Instagram account picked up the post and shared the same. Now, going by these claims, the problem of parody accounts, misinformation and rudimentary understanding of the same, even among the party workers and leaders, seem to be at the heart of the row. While announcing the poll schedule, the Election Commission claimed to be prepared to tackle the challenge of both the MCC violation and misinformation. Uh, the Kangana Supriya controversy involves both. The complaint has already reached the Election Commission, so the ball is already in its court. How the poll body reacts, what actions it takes, and how effective they prove to be will be watched closely. In some news that came in earlier today, Julian Assange has been given a chance to continue his fight against extradition to the United States. A UK court has ruled that Assange cannot be extradited till the US proves certain assurances and a guarantee that he will not be given the death penalty. The court has given the US three weeks to respond and the judges have said that another hearing will be held on the 20th of May to decide whether Assange should be granted leave should be granted leave to appeal against his extradition. Julian Assange has been lodged in a London jail since 2019 after he was arrested from the Embassy of Ecuador where he had sought asylum in 2012. The US government is seeking to put Assange on trial on charges of espionage for the WikiLeaks release of confidential military records and diplomatic cables that created a global stir. In fact, in June 2022, the British government had approved the extradition. It is this ruling that he has been trying to overturn in a few hearings since then. Today's verdict gives Assange further time. If the assurances required from the US government are not given within the three-week time frame, Assange will be granted leave appeal in the UK. However, if the assurances are given, there will be another UK court hearing on the 20th of May to make a final decision on granting Assange leave to appeal. to the race to power in the US. Joe Biden and Donald Trump have a new rival. He is literally anybody else. Literally anybody else. That's the name. That wasn't the case always. The man used to go by the name Dustin Abe. 
He is a 35-year-old U.S. Army veteran from Texas. He teaches maths to 7th grade students, but now he has decided to run for the elections. He wants to give Biden and Trump competition for the presidential post. Although he needs 113,000 signatures from non-primary Texan voters by May to get his new name on the ballots, which seems highly unlikely, but still, the man is trying his luck. Why is he doing that? He says he is not satisfied with either of the front-runner candidates. Ebe, or literally anybody else, says he is tired of the constant power grab, the tussle between Republicans and Democrats, and Americans don't have many options to choose from. And so he changed his name to prove a point. He says it's not only his name, but an idea. A rally cry. U.S. voters don't have a none of the above or neither option on the ballot. So he basically wants to serve as that option. Is he wrong? The man does have a point. This year, Americans won't be voting for the best candidate, but for who is slightly better than the other one. They will be choosing between the king of debt and the king of gaffes, between a 77-year-old and an 81-year-old. Both Biden and Trump face their own challenges. Let's just talk about President Biden first. He is the most unpopular president since the end of the Second World War. Right after coming to power, he ordered a hasty and chaotic evacuation of troops from Afghanistan. Two weeks later, when the crisis ended, 13 U.S. service members had been killed. Hundreds or more U.S. citizens, along with, Afghans, Af 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 along with Afghans, had been left to fend for themselves under the Taliban's brutal rule. This was just the beginning. Biden's war on fossil fuels helped drive domestic production down and gasoline prices through the roof. And then he begged the organization of the petroleum exporting countries, a foreign oil cartel, to produce more oil. And this will result in the same emissions as domestically produced oil. Under the Biden administration, two wars have broken out in the world and both have been handled very poorly. Just months after Biden's disastrous retreat from Afghanistan, Russia invaded Ukraine. From the start, Biden took the moral high ground, framing the conflict in Ukraine as a global one. Between democracy and autocracy, he rejected Moscow's fears of NATO expansion towards its borders as baseless. He also overestimated Ukraine's capacity for war. He has been sending aid to Ukraine, but only after a lot of pleading. And this has not only prolonged the war, but also weakened the support in the Congress for military aid to Ukraine. And now his handling of the Israel-Hamas war seems to be the final nail in the coffin. He failed to rein in the civilian casualties in Gaza. He also failed to send in enough humanitarian aid despite multiple U.S. high-level visits to West Asia. A ceasefire or hostage exchange still looks like a far cry. And now it seems it won't be able to dissuade Israel from launching a ground offensive in Rafah either. And when asked about truce, President Biden casually gave out deadlines while licking ice cream. You heard that right. Take a look. Well, I hope by the beginning of the weekend, I mean the end of the weekend, at least my, my, my national security advisor tells me that we're close. We're close. It's not done yet. And my hope is by next Monday, we'll have a ceasefire. How do you go with the President of the United States and the number two things, Ray Ban sunglasses and ice cream? Can you believe that? Clearly, Biden will also be remembered for butchering U.S. diplomacy and embarrassing himself. Let's talk about the other candidate now, former President Donald Trump, the first one in American history to be criminally charged. To begin with, he is embroiled in four legal cases, facing as many as 91 charges, and it does not even stop there. He also faces several civil cases relating to his business empire, sexual abuse allegations, defamation, and then there are financial troubles. Trump has about 10 days to come up with a $175 million bond in his New York civil fraud case. And to top it all, there are his reckless public remarks. In February, he provoked an unusually quick rebuke from leaders around the world. 
How? He said that he would encourage Russia to do whatever they want to any NATO member that does not live up to the goals they agreed on in 2014. A direct invitation to war and such disdain for NATO. It did not go exactly in Trump's favor. My point is clear, I guess. These are the options that Americans have this year. Would they rather choose literally anybody else is the question. Our next story is about China's aggression against the world. It's about China doing what it does best. Let me tell you what happened earlier this evening. The UK government summoned China's ambassador. Why? To condemn cyber attacks by Beijing linked groups. This is a major escalation and this story has been fast developing. You see, after the US and the UK, New Zealand has pointed fingers at China for running a cyber espionage campaign. The cyber row has only grown bigger. The British government earlier blamed China for a series of cyber attacks on UK democratic institutions. It is a serious charge. Britain's Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden has said that Chinese state-affiliated actors were behind two malicious attacks on the UK's electoral watchdog and on lawmakers. He did not mince any words, by the way, calling the cyber threat posed by China-affiliated actors real and serious. The UK is imposing sanctions on two individuals. And how has China reacted to the claims, you ask? It calls them slander. Earlier, the US indicted seven Chinese individuals for alleged efforts to conduct malicious cyber operations against critical networks. The Chinese hacking group APT31 has been accused by the UK and US officials of targeting critics of Beijing. APT31 stands for Advanced Persistent Threat 31. It comes with different names, by, by the way. It's also called Violet Typhoon, Judgment Panda, and Altair. As per the U.S. Justice Department, it is run by China's Ministry of State Security from the city of Wuhan. Now, remember, we've been telling you about China's Ministry of State Security and what it has been up to. It is the same ministry that earlier published a post titled Countering Espionage Requires the Mobilization of All Members of Society basically wanting people to participate in counter-espionage work, encouraging people to inform about suspected foreign spies, calling on all members of the society to join its fight against espionage. Now, like I said earlier, New Zealand systems have also been attacked. New Zealand blamed state-sponsored Chinese hackers for a 2021 cyber attack that infiltrated sensitive government computer systems. And by the way, that's not the only form of Chinese aggression we are talking about. There is more here. China is also flexing its muscle with a new addition to its arsenal. What am I talking about? A new attack helicopter. It's called the Z-20 attack helicopter. Just for context here, this one comes with better capabilities than its predecessors. And by the way, Chinese President Xi Jinping himself inspected the manufacturing facilities in Jiangxi last October. You know what the attack helicopter is comparable to? The American military's advanced AH-64 Apache. According to a report in the South China Morning Post, in fact, the latest addition is being viewed as a crucial element in potential conflicts. The message is clear. China's aggression knows no bounds. The question is, where do things go from here? Will the dragon ever stop breathing fire? Is this the end of TikTok? Why do I ask that? 
because it looks like a new social media application is here to outthrow TikTok, at least in the Western markets. I'm talking about the app called Sho Hong Shu, which translates to Little Red Book in English. The app has over 300 million monthly active users. According to reports, young Americans are now signing up on Sho Hong Shu. They have a reason to set up their account on this new Chinese social media app. Apparently, users in the US are tired of receiving fake compliments and offensive comments. Let's just understand this better with an example. In the West, when you ask someone, how do I look? Chances are they will say, you look great no matter what. It is this uh, statement, in a way, that the American youth is opposing and is tired of, as per reports. They believe Shaw Hong Shu provides them with honest and civil feedback. Case in point, if a user wants honest opinion on a haircut, for example, they explicitly ask for it. App users also don't shy away from sharing their true opinions. Some share tips on how it could be made better. Others are quick on giving advice on what hairstyle would look best according to their face structure. While Shaw Hong Shu is gaining popularity in the U.S. now, the app has been in existence for years. The Chinese online platform, which was established in 2013, is often described as Beijing's answer to Instagram. It started out as an app for Chinese travelers seeking shopping trips. And over the years, Shaw Hong Shu has evolved into a user-generated encyclopedia. It focuses on beauty, shopping, travel, and lifestyle, lifestyle topics, for example. Um, on how to get through pregnancy or recover from divorce. These are also being discussed on the social media platform. The emergence of a new Chinese online app could not be more ill-timed as far as TikTok is concerned. Now, if TikTok does not adhere to American laws, the app could soon be banned in the country. According to a bill passed by the U.S. House of Representatives, ByteDance, the parent company of TikTok, has six months to divest TikTok or face a total ban in the country. Apart from the U.S., the U.K. government, in fact, has also raised concern over TikTok's security policy. TikTok is already banned in several countries, of course, including India. There are fears that TikTok could harvest user data which could be exploited by China. When it comes to Chinese apps... Privacy has always been a cause of concern and now it remains to be seen how the U.S. authorities would deal with the growing popularity of Shaw Hong Shu, which perhaps could become the next TikTok. As global supply chains undergo a transformation, India emerges as a formidable challenger to China's long-held manufacturing dominance. With a surge in international investment and strategic reforms, India's industrial landscape is rapidly evolving. Take a look at our next report for more. For decades, China has reigned supreme as the world's manufacturing hub. However, a changing geopolitical landscape is creating opportunities for challengers. Rising tensions between the U.S. and China are prompting many manufacturers to diversify their supply chains. This coupled with China's rising labor costs has opened the door for other countries to step in. India, with its young population, is a prime candidate. The government has implemented reforms to streamline business regulations and attract foreign investment. Several Indian states, like Tamil Nadu, have become hubs for major international companies, including Apple and Foxconn. Data paints a complex picture of India's manufacturing potential. The sector currently contributes only 17% of India's GDP compared to China's 28%. However, India's manufacturing sector is experiencing significant growth with a focus on higher value activities like electronics production. The Indian government is actively courting foreign investment through production-linked incentive schemes. These schemes provide financial benefits to companies that manufacture specific products in India. This strategy has attracted major players, which have recently established or committed to establishing production facilities in the country. Experts believe that India can carve its own path in manufacturing by leveraging its strengths in tech and software development. Integrating these skills with traditional manufacturing could empower India to develop a unique and competitive manufacturing ecosystem. 
While India boasts a significant advantage in demographics, challenges remain. The country's education system struggles to equip all graduates with the necessary skills, especially in rural areas. Additionally, India's infrastructure, while improving, still lags behind China's extensive network. If India can overcome these hurdles, it has the potential to become a major player in the global manufacturing landscape. The upcoming national elections could be a turning point. Prime Minister Modi, seeking a third term, has prioritized economic reforms and infrastructure development. By report, we on World is One. On that note, it's a wrap on this edition of Gravitas Tonight. This is me, Molly Gampir, signing off. We're we leaving you with Gravitas Images. Thanks very much for watching. Oh! <laughs> Só queria jogar futebol, só quero jogar, só quero fazer de tudo pelo meu clube e pela, pela minha família. The biggest democratic exercise on the planet ever. Decoding the multiple colors of this multi-dimensional, multi-layered spectacle. Weon deciphers the images and the hues. Sifts real performance from rhetoric and noise, claims and counterclaims, populist pitches and hidden truths. Untangling, unraveling this celebration of democracy. Everyone loves the contest. But sport isn't just about victory and defeat. When the goats in sport speak, you hear it first on Wion. You have to play good cricket over a period of time. 
you know, I should push myself right out of the damn tournament. We go beyond the stats. Our stories are quoted the world over. At We Are, sport is part of our DNA. Come, join us on this journey. Weekday, 6.30 p.m. IST, 1 p.m. GMT. Ready to dive into your daily dose of news? Bringing you what's trending in the West and all that's setting trends in the East. And all of this served up with a side of insightful bank. We don't just bring you the latest stories. We bring you your talking points for the day. And while you do that, from the busy streets of New York, I will provide you with deeper insights on the developments through the course of the day in the U.S. From New York, we get you to the sandy shores of Durban, where I'll bring you all the glitz, glam, and happenings from the world of showbiz. Welcome to the Eras Tour. And I will be here at the Vion headquarters, getting you all the action from the universe of sport. All that you need to know about your favorite teams and players, right here. The show that keeps you ahead of the global curve. A conversation you'd want to be a part of. A place where news becomes an engaging exchange. We bring you stories that impact your present. This is World DNA. Join the conversation. India's global voice, the channel that brings you the biggest stories from across the world through India's lens. Now available in more than 190 countries worldwide, because we believe that the world is one. Watch us in Africa, Europe, USA and Canada, South America, Asia Pacific, Middle East and North African regions. Also available on these digital platforms across the world. We on. World is one. Economic turmoil and global unrest have cast a shadow over President Joe Biden's approval ratings. The rockets are continuing to be fired by Hamas in Gaza, although at a slower rate than previously. So, right now, we are with the volunteers from the Aleppo municipality. They are still trying to go to the rescue for the people they can find out. India has emerged as a major diplomatic force at the world stage. The rising cost of living in Nigeria continues to impact citizens from all walks of life. The citizens of Gujarat witnessed a mega roadshow here in the city of Ahmedabad. China is South Africa's largest trading partner for 134 years straight. A domestic aircraft carrying 72 people on board uh, crashed in Pokhara city in central Nepal. 165 injured have been moved, 61 people are confirmed dead and rescue operations continue around me. After receiving an entire season's rainfall in a span of 48 hours, Chennai city has literally been brought to its knees.
From the bustling trading floors of Wall Street to the vibrant exchanges of Asian stock markets, we on breaks it down for you to make sense of what's happening as we reveal the key factors behind events, strategic battles, and the game-changing business decisions that shape the world. We bring you all of this and more on World Business Watch. We on India's global voice, a channel that brings you the biggest stories from across the world through India's lens. Now available in more than 190 countries worldwide. Because we believe that the world is one. Watch us in Africa, Europe, USA and Canada, South America, Asia Pacific, Middle East and North African regions. Also available on these digital platforms across the world. We on. World is one. Economic turmoil and global unrest have cast a shadow over President Joe Biden's approval ratings. The rockets are continuing to be fired by Hamas in Gaza, although at a slower rate than previously. So, right now, we are with the volunteers from the Aleppo municipality. They are